Welcome to Straight Out of Savannah, Talking with Tammy, a podcast that showcases people you may not know who are choosing to use their gifts to inspire and move the planet. Thank you so much for joining us on Straight Out of Savannah. I am super excited. My guest, Mark Rodriguez, is here, and he's going to share a little bit about who he is and what it is that he does. So, Mark, take it away. Well, thank you, Tammy, for having me on tonight. Uh, it's my honor to be here. And uh, as she said, my name is Mark Rodriguez. I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I am known as the Lung Transplant Stonemason. I am the only stonemason in the history of the world to ever do stonemasonry after two double lung transplants. <laughs> yes, you heard that right. Two of them. And uh, my whole message is that it's not just good enough to survive. Because if you're just talking about surviving, eventually it becomes a sob story. It only, your story only matters when you thrive after you survive. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so let's get into it. All let's right. talk about how you how you got there and how, you know, what happened when you um when you found out that you needed to have a lung transplant. You know, tell me about how that went through. Well, in 2010, I was diagnosed with silicosis fibrosis. And that's a lung disease that I attained through my work. Uh, through breathing in the fine silica dust that's associated with doing stonework. But that's not where my downfall began. My downfall began when I had Superman disease. Oh. Uh, that's the one where we think we're invincible <laughs> and nothing can hurt us. But there's a quick cure for that. It's uh, when a doctor is standing by your hospital bed and says, Mark, you're dying. Boom, you're cured. And so uh, <laughs> instead of operating in safety, I was for a large part of my career as a stonemason operating in ignorant machismo. And by the time I started protecting myself and wearing masks and whatnot, it was actually uh, a little bit too late. Okay. Because this disease does not reveal itself until the end stage and there's no cure for it. Oh, wow. Mm. And so in 2010, I, I that's when life interrupted hit me harder than any hammer I've ever struck my chisel with. Mm. And uh, that was when my fight began. And that was when I embraced my warrior spirit and mindset and um, began the the biggest battle and the biggest fight of my entire life, which is for my life. Mm hmm. And then uh, I was ill for a year. I was on oxygen 24-7. Uh, there was plenty of dark times within that year. Yeah. But there was also plenty of um, progress and plenty of evolving and leveling up in ways that I had never done before. See, God makes us up of three parts, the by the body, the mind and and the soul or the spirit. Mm -hmm. And although I was as strong as a horse in my body, um, I was not so much in my 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 mind and in my spirit. And so when my body failed, uh, because the other two parts weren't strong enough, I basically, you know, people talk about hitting rock bottom. Well. I was on the bottom of the rock. That's oh, wow. how far down I went. Mm. So I had to figure out how to get from underneath the rock to get on top of the rock so I could be at rock bottom. Oh, wow. But um, along, uh, along this time period, it was many battles. Uh, battles uh, within my mind of whether or not I was going to be a warrior and fight, or if I was going to uh, 
shroud myself with the tools of the weak and uh, take on the face of a coward by quitting. Hmm. But I just, I never could bring myself to quit. I like guess as bad as it was, um, because my father never allowed me to quit anything. Mm -hmm. Never taught us that. Yeah. Father was a Hall of Fame basketball coach for 30 years in New Mexico. Okay. So quitting was never really an option. But then my daughter was um, about 14 at the time when I first got ill. And I felt like if I quit on her, if I quit my fight, I was unconsciously telling her she wasn't worth me fighting for. Oh, wow. So she oh. was my why. Yeah. She was my reason for enduring everything that I have. Um, and a lot of people tell me like, Mark, you've been through so much. I feel so bad for you or I'm sorry for you. And I said, don't do that. Right. Like, honestly, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Mm. Because wow. I see life differently now. And I live life differently now. Yeah. And yes, the lessons that I've learned have been hard ones. But being yeah. a stonemason, many times we're guilty of learning things the hard way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pun intended. <laughs> those are the ones that stick. Mm -hmm. Because the cost to learn those lessons is... is much steeper yes um but uh, there was many valuable life lessons that came to me because i got sick so mm -hmm. i can't look at it like it was a bad thing because i no longer take things for granted mm -hmm. i'm no longer looking off into the future i live more in the moment yeah um and admittedly i did take my my craft for granted I was very, very skilled. And uh, I was that guy uh, risking dislocating my own shoulder, patting myself on the back. Oh. Uh, and and so that was a lesson that I learned. I also learned that time with my daughter, there was that was priceless. There was no there's no price that you could put on that. Right. And so I value that much more. Sometimes instead of going to work, I'll call her up and I'll spend time with her and my grandson. That's so awesome. Because before, when I was at the height of my career and I was operating at a very high level, I was always, I was never in the moment. I was always thinking, we got to finish this job in two weeks because we have another job and we have to finish that within a month because in two months we have that huge job that's going to take four months or whatever. And I was always thinking in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And I, was, I was in the moment, but not fully. Right. And I lost a lot of opportunities that pass you by when you're too far looking ahead too far. And yeah. sometimes when you're looking behind you too right. much. Mm hmm on what's right in front of you and that's the present yes and kind of in a, in a many ways forgot that they call the present the present for a reason because each and every day we get is a true gift yes whether it's hard or it's good or it's bad Absolutely, or yes yeah i mean every day is truly a gift and then i think a lot of us are guilty of this that we take breathing for granted because sometimes it's so easy it yeah. just happens. And sometimes we don't even have to try. It just happens. And then when something serious does happen, then that's when we say, oh, okay, I need to take a deep breath. You know, yeah. when we get nervous or when we get yes. angry or yes. whatever, and we're like, okay, take a deep breath. But yes. that's really the only time we think about it because the rest of the time it's kind of on autopilot. Yeah. But when you get sick, I'll be honest with you that there's no other feeling in the world that uh, causes more fear or, or scares you as much yes. as not being able to breathe. It's well, like you're, yeah. it's like you're drowning on the land. Mm. God. <laughs> you can't take that breath in. And your airways are closing up and 
things start moving that should not be moving. Mm. And it's scary. Um, I, I say this a lot when I do my presentations is that I, I ask people to close their eyes and take a deep breath. And then as they open their eyes, imagine breathing through a straw for a year. Oh, goodness gracious. That was me. Uh, from 2010 to 2011, uh, I was 8% lung function. Jesus, Jesus. Uh -huh. And so that's not very much. The whole right lung was gone. And then the left lung was just a small piece up here that was operating. Wow. And they had no idea how I was still alive, much less working. You were working with that? I was working like that. Doing a stone mason work? Yeah. And then I woke oh. up on Saturday morning and I felt horrible and I couldn't breathe. And I thought I had the flu. And so I went to the emergency room and... Uh, you know, I thought they were going to give me Tamiflu or something and say, go home and rest. But when they checked my vitals and they checked my oxygen, it was at 66. <laughs> and they said, How did you get in here? And I said, I walked from the parking lot and they were like, you could have been in cardiac arrest. Like, don't move. Like my heart rate was like 150 or something like that. And so they immediately sent me for an x-ray. And with a half hour, they were admitting me to the hospital. And that's when everything got real. And then at first, they thought I had tuberculosis. So they put me in a sealed off room. And everybody had to have like these gowns. And yep. they had to be covered head to toe. Mm -hmm. be masked and their heads covered, their feet even covered to come in the room. And I thought I was in the middle of like some futuristic movie. I <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> like it was, I was freaking out, to be honest. I can imagine. And after three days, they got the results back and it was negative. So they put me in a regular room. But it was at that point that the doctor came and said, Mark, you're dying of a lung disease. And uh, the only thing that will save you is a double lung transplant. But it's a lengthy process, and more than likely, you won't make it that long. Wow. So from the very beginning, I was getting doubt from those who were supposed to be caring for me. Yeah. And so uh, they told me, you'll never do stonework again. Wow. And that threw me into a depression for about five days. Yeah, because you, it, that's what you love right yeah i mean i started when i was 17 years old okay and i graduated high school and so then i played college basketball so on all my breaks i would come home and do stonework um and i was made for stonework i truly believe that mm -hmm. and i believe that i did stonework in another lifetime because when they were trying to teach me things it wasn't as if i was hearing something for the first time mm-hmm it was more like if I was just remembering something. Yeah. And so um, I've always had this real deep connection to stonework. That even in the prime of my career, when every anytime I was on like a, a deadline job or something really big was going on, I would, I would have these recurring dream. And uh, this dream... I was cutting this huge block of stone mm -hmm. and it was so big. I had to climb up on another block of stone just to get to the top of it. Okay. And it was rounded off and I was trying to flatten it out, but this thing was huge. It's probably as big as a car. Mm. And I couldn't get this round spot off and I got real mad and I just, I went into it real hard Ugh, and I grunted and everything. And when I hit it, I hit it with all my force. And it made me cough. And I and and I coughed out blood and it went on my arm and it went on the stone. Well, when I looked down at my arm, I noticed something. So it made me look at my whole body. And my whole body was covered in white powder. And all I was wearing was a loincloth. Oh, wow. And I jumped off the block of stone. And I went to a little puddle of water. And I looked at my reflection and there was blood spatter on my chin 
my chest, my arm. And all I was wearing was a loincloth and I was covered in white powder. Well, that was my dreams trying to tell me something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I didn't get it. I didn't, no, I was going to say. <laughs> obviously, right? I was going to say many times. This that was, happens. This was way over a decade before I even got sick. Okay. Maybe even closer to a decade and a half. It was so, way before I even got sick. So were you used to having dreams, prophetic dreams like that? or, or Not no? really, no. Okay. So it was something that was different and new for you. Yeah, it was new for me, but it always, I mean, I would wake up, I'd be in a cold sweat. I couldn't breathe. I was hyperventilating. I was freaking out. I mean, it was a, it was kind of a traumatic experience. Yeah. And I never really put two and two together until after I got sick and a doctor was explaining to me about the disease. And he says, there's two ways you could die from this disease. One that your, your lungs give out because there's no more function. But the other way that you could die is, is that you cough a lot. And eventually you'll cough so much that your pulmonary artery will burst and you'll bleed out. Oh, jeez. Yeah. In a minute. And so uh, I never put it together until that moment. But, you know, it was too late. It was too late then. Right. Well, uh, about a year to the day that I went to the hospital to get checked, I was in the pulmonary rehabilitation gymnasium at the local hospital where I live. And I was working out and my phone rang. And it was the hospital in Colorado. And they said, get to the airport. There's a jet waiting there for you. Wow. And I mean, I was was frozen. I couldn't even speak. And so the coordinator was giving me all the instructions over the phone and everything. And she, do you hear what I said? And I said, yes, I did, but I can't talk. I was just frozen. And anyways, I, I got there. It was a 12 hour surgery and the surgeons actually had to use a hammer and chisel to remove my solid as stone lungs. Wow. So you're, wow. You talk about ironic, like these were two of the tools that I built my career with and now they're being used to save my life. Yes. And so that was, that was very, very ironic that, that, that was the case. Um, But I walked out of that hospital in eight days. Mm. Oh. It's only a mask, just a just a regular mask, like the ones you get in the hospital. A double lung transplant. Eight days. Eight days. And was I, I was playing in a men's basketball league five and a half months after my transplant. And these were able-bodied men. These weren't anybody that had any kind of things wrong with them. You are a superman. <laughs> At seven months, I ran a 5K. And uh, I've always been an athlete. I've always been around sports. So my thing was, is that if I'm going to get back to this, I have to get into training like I used to train prior to college basketball seasons. And so that's what I did. Um, but the, one of the things that really put me in the right mindset was when I was first hospitalized and the doctor came in and he said, Mark, you're dying of lung disease. The only thing that can save you is the double lung transplant. Blah, blah, blah. Right? And then my mom and dad walked in the room about a minute after he left. And my dad said, I saw the doctor walking out. What did he say? And I snapped at my dad. And he wasn't the kind of man that you snapped at. He was a big, strong man. And he was all about respect. He was all about discipline. And he just that he wasn't the man you snapped at. And you said basketball coach, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, but I did. I snapped at him and I said, he said, I'm dying, dad. And my dad just kind of took a pause and he calmed himself. And then he gave me these words and they're probably the best words he ever gave me. He said, well, you better get busy then. And I looked at him and I said, I said to myself, like, what? Did the you hear what I said? Me I'm dying and he's telling me to get busy? 
And then he said, and don't waste anybody's time either. And I said, dad, you heard what I said. The doctor said, I'm dying. What are you saying? And he says, well, it looks like you have your mind to make up. Whether you're going to be a warrior and fight for your life. Or if you're going to go in the corner and curl up in a ball, give up and quit like a coward. <laughs> he said, get busy making up your mind and don't waste anybody's time. And I'm going to remind you, son, that I never raised any quitters. And then my mom followed that up with, son, you got to give it to God. He's the only one that can help you. The kind of help you need right now, God's the only one that can help you. And so that's what I did. I started fighting like a warrior and I gave it to God. And only through the grace and mercy of God and, and me never quitting and believing that I could beat this, this thing I was up against yeah. is the reason why I'm on this program tonight wow. and able to do the things that I'm doing. Um, but three and a half years into that first transplant, I had a fall that caused a pulmonary embolism. Oh, wow. The size of a nickel. Oh, wow. And that should have killed me within days. Yes. But I lasted four, over four and a half months with that bomb inside my lung. And again, the doctors couldn't believe how I was still alive. And again, gave me no chance. Mm. Mm -hmm. But my first team in Colorado, when I got the pulmonary embolism, they never told me about the pulmonary embolism. They said I was in chronic rejection. I had two months to live and there was nothing they could do for me. And then I told them, well, which one of you did God call? <laughs> Which one of you did God call? Because he didn't call me. I didn't get that call. And they're like, come on, Mark. You can't be in denial. This is really happening. You're not going to beat this. You're not going to get out of this. And I said, I'm not in denial. Every time the breath leaves my body, so does life. I feel that. I know what's happening. I'm not in denial. But if God did not call you and he did not call me, yours is an opinion, albeit a professional opinion, but it's opinion nonetheless. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep fighting with God and Jesus as my leaders. And it looks like you guys are ready to check out this fight. So do it fast and get out of my face because I can't stand quitters. <laughs> what did they say? My rear view mirror and I came home to die. But I was just trying to make it two months in one day. So somebody could tell them you were wrong. Yeah. But at three months, the great doctors at St. Joe's uh, Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona, called me and said, we're willing to give you an evaluation to see if we can put you on the list. And they said, when can you be here? And I said, is tomorrow morning too soon? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I don't, time's not really on my side, so I can't wait long. Yeah. And you and weren't so there here on um, December 5th of 2015 and then they put me in the hospital for two weeks to do this evaluation and on December 19th they gave me the news that they could list me but that I had to move there and that's when they discharged me well I wasn't actually listed until January 19th so that month that month You know, people talk about it's one day at a time. Well, my one day at a time turned into one sunrise and one sunset at a time and eventually one hour at a time. Mm. Yeah. Every time I went to go use the restroom, which was 15 feet away from my deathbed, mm -hmm. my oxygen would dip into the low 60s. My heart rate would go into the high 150s, and I was risking cardiac arrest just to go use the restroom. Yes. God got me back to that bed every single time. Yes. Yes. And then on January 23rd, I was on the list for four days. I got the call. 
But before I got the call, about a minute before I got the call, I was laying in bed and I had this sensation two times. And they were one right after the other, where it felt like my body was floating away. Mm -hmm. I was just, I grabbed onto the covers and I was literally hanging on for dear life. Mm. My knuckles white, everything. And it happened twice. Mm. And then my daughter noticed something was going on. And she asked me, you know, what's, what's up, dad? What's the matter? What's going on? And I said, nothing. I'm all right. I'm all right. So she walked out of the room and she said, grandma, something's wrong with my dad. And he won't tell me. So my mom walked in. <laughs> and that day when I woke up, I struggled to the restroom. I almost fell. My mom heard me and she came in and got me back to the bed. And she said, what's the matter? I said, I just feel really weak, mom. So she said, why don't you eat some fruit? Maybe it'll make you feel better. So she brought me a bowl of fruit and I ate a piece of watermelon, and a piece of cantaloupe. And I was breathing like I had just run a marathon. Wow. And I told her, I can't, mom, just take it. And that day I didn't get out of bed again. I didn't eat anything. I didn't drink anything. If I went to got the call that night, that definitely would have been my last day. If wow. I went to got the call when I did, I would have died probably soon after those two episodes. Yeah. Well, I got the call. They said, get to the hospital. We have your lungs. But at that point, I was 120 pounds. I couldn't even walk anymore. I was in a wheelchair. And so even getting to the hospital was quite the challenge. Yeah. And when I got there and they took me in, and the doctor came in. I said, hey, doc, I, I'm getting this weird sensation that my body's floating away. And he said, Mark, that's, that's not your body floating away. That's your soul trying to leave your body. You're in your last hour of life. He said, you've been fighting this long. Just keep fighting. Fight harder than you've ever fought before. And we're going to fight for you too. But you can't give up now. You got to keep fighting. Mm. And I just looked at him like, with my hard-headed stonemason attitude and said, well, what are we doing in here? We got to get in there. <laughs> we got to get in there and get to work, doc. I'm ready. Are you ready? And so, you know, we went in and it was another 12-hour surgery. But this one was a lot tougher because I was very sick. I was uh, very weak. I was underweight. Um, and I actually died on the table during the second surgery. Um, and at that point, I got a front row seat to the battle for my soul. Mm. And uh, God had other plans. Apparently. <laughs> and uh, after a nine-day coma, I woke up. And it seemed like it was five minutes. That was the bizarre part. Like, it really seemed like five minutes. And... It was actually nine days. And I was in the hospital for a month and the recovery was real tough. Yeah. It was very tough. And in many ways, I still haven't even recovered. Uh, that are things that I'm working through. I don't still don't take long showers uh, because showers were a nightmare for me when I was sick that second time. It was like torture. Yeah. If I wasn't out of there in one minute, I was risking death. It was scary. And, uh, you know, there's some other other things that when you go through traumatic events, there's some things that stick with you. Yes. But it's our responsibility to um, put ourselves back together to heal. Yes. And many times healing looks like hurting. Yes. Very painful. Yes, absolutely. But without healing, there is no growth. Right. And without growth, there's definitely no chance at leveling up yes. or evolving. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so you're not doing stonemason work now, right? Actually did it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but I will admit, 
I am a bit crazy, but I'm not stupid. I protect myself much better now. Okay, good. <laughs> I was thinking, I'm like, he didn't go back. <laughs> I did. I did. And I'm the only stonemason in the history of the world to ever do that after two double lung transplants. Like, the road I'm walking on, no one's ever been on. I can imagine. So you are definitely a trailblazer. So I feel like I have a certain responsibility to show people that there's really nothing that's impossible unless you put it here. Yes. Our mind is the strongest thing we have. But it depends on what you feed it. Absolutely. Our greatest ally or our worst enemy. Yeah. And and there was a few times where it, mine was my worst enemy. And one of those times was uh, around 2019. I was in a very dark place. Uh, and not just because of my medical struggles, admittedly, some of my own bad choices. But if you're going to work on yourself, you have to do the tough work. And if that means looking in your mirror or looking at yourself introspectively, and if that's what's necessary, then that's what's necessary. Yeah. Else you're never going to evolve. You're never going to change. You're never going to do better or get better. Yeah. And many times people don't have the courage to look in their own mirror and say, you're messing up. Yes. This is on you. Until mm -hmm. I developed that, then, you know, I was, I thought I was mad at God. Mm hmm Wondering what it, why I was even still here. I didn't know my purpose. I didn't understand why a lot of things, like why I was still suffering and still struggling. And yeah. And but I really wasn't mad at God. I was mad at myself. Yeah. But it wasn't until I got in my mirror and said, This is on you, man. You're the one that's not making it happen. How could you be mad at God? He saved you from death three times. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. And it wasn't until I looked in my mirror and looked at myself at a real close uh, angle, introspectively, that I was able to uh, come to that realization. Yeah. And uh, and that's tough. That's mm -hmm. tough for everybody. Even the most mentally strong people, it's tough for. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so... I a simple conversation I was having with a buddy of mine. Um, it was August of 2020. COVID was raging. Ooh, right. Was middle hearing, of the pandemic. All I was hearing about was uh, uh, immunosuppressed people are going to go fast. It yes. attacks the lungs yes. and everything about breathing. And all I was was trying to in, ignore all those things. And just enjoy my time in quarantine that I was having with my future wife. Mm -hmm. It was a great time because that's when we really got to know each other. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were together choice, right? all day, all night. Yes. And the thing that we noticed was we never got sick of each other. Yeah. And that's when I knew, like, yeah, we're supposed to be married. Yeah. Because I didn't even need, I wasn't even get to a point, or nor nor did she get to the point where say I need a break. Can yeah. you just go in the other room and leave me alone for a while? It was never like that. Yeah. I mean, it was actually fun. But then when you turn on the news and you hear all this other stuff, that's when things would get in my mind. Yeah. Well, I, stopped, I stopped listening. I kind of got, I, you know, I, I, I kind of got this this got into this place in my mind and my buddy asked me you know when they kind of opened it up a little bit uh I said come over for some burgers we'll put some burgers on the grill we could sit outside and we can you know space ourselves out so we're not taking any risks and it'll just be us mm -hmm. and so he came over and he asked me one simple question how are you doing Mark and I did. I told him, I said, not too good, Rico. I'm like struggling, man. I, I, you know, I don't know really what my purpose is. 
And if it wasn't for the great time I was having with my wife, who knows how dark that place could have got. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I just told him, I said this simple thing. If I could just do stonework again, I think I might be all right. And he said, well, why don't you do it? And, <laughs> and I, I told him something that made him very, very mad. I said, I don't think I can. And he got mad at me. You're always the one telling people, don't say I can't. You're always the one saying, you got to believe in yourself. You're always the one saying, don't doubt yourself. Thousands of people will. Don't become one of them. And he checked me hardcore with my own words. I was going to say he gave me your I medicine back. Doing, I see what you're doing and rightfully so. You're right. You know, I can't talk about it and then not be about it. Mm -hmm. You're right. Well, about four days after that, he died in a motorcycle accident. Oh, my goodness gracious. And uh, I vowed that I would not take that conversation in vain. Yeah. I would not let that conversation go in vain. Mm -hmm. And that's when I returned to stonework. And that's when this guy was born. <laughs> nice the lung transplant stonemason love it and yeah. that was the comeback for i mean the recovery from my first transplant was somewhere here the recovery from my second transplant was way up here and my comeback to stonework after both transplants was somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. it was super difficult like nobody makes a comeback to stonework in their 50s yeah. Much less. Obviously, nobody has made a comeback after two double lung transplants. Right. Um, so there was a lot of days where, you know, I, I was just so beat up. I couldn't even talk about it. Uh, <laughs> one day in particular, I was driving home on a Friday. And I was so tired that I was too tired to cry. But I was too tired to hold the tears back. It was a weird place to be in. Yeah. And I was driving home and the window was down. I didn't even have music on. The radio was off. And I could feel the wind hitting my cheeks. And that's how I knew tears were rolling down. And when I got home, I limped into the house. And I struggled to take all my gear off. And I jumped in the shower. And I was doing that thing that I tell everybody not to do. And I started feeling sorry for myself and then I got mad at myself and I said you punk how dare you how dare you you shouldn't even be here to feel this pain you should be grateful for it mm -hmm. and then in the next breath I just screamed these words out loud at the top of my lungs well god then help me turn my pain into power Help me turn my heartaches into helpfulness. Help me turn <laughs> my traumas into teachings and triumphs. And I continue to pray that prayer every day. And it works. Mm. It absolutely works. Because I have done all those things. And it led me, which is what led me to uh, beginning to write a book. I had no idea that it was going to be that hard. <laughs> I'm going to recall the memories and I'm going to write them down and it's going to be all good. Well, it wasn't all good. No. And was, this is the, the period of my life when I realized that I was in need of some serious healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was like ripping open the wound and reliving it all again. And the healing looked like hurting oh. and felt like pain. But the only way that I was going to grow was to heal first. Yes. And, I, and it led me to not just healing from my lung transplants and losing my career and losing. I lost everything. Mm -hmm. I lost my house. I lost my business. I lost all my equipment that I built my business with, my truck. But I was still alive. I, I, I still had the thing that you couldn't replace. Yeah. And so 
I felt like, you know, I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but I started writing this book and it took me a while. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be out soon. But it's been a, a couple years now, actually, that I started writing it and then found a publisher and got it to the right people. And then now they have it and they're working on it. And so it's coming soon. Awesome. What's the name of it? Just Breathe and Believe. Oh, that's going to be nice. And that's also the name of the new talk show that I'm going to be doing uh, on the Onstage Plus Network. Nice. Just Breathe and Believe. It's a half hour format. And I'll be talking about things that uh, that warriors do. And we're all warriors innately. It just takes different things to bring it out of us. Absolutely. And uh, with me, um, I, I, I fully realize that as a warrior, my fight may lead to my death. But I'm not fixated on that. No. I've accepted it and I move on in my battles. Yes. And I also know that warriors always win because warriors always fight. The minute you stop fighting, you're not a warrior anymore. You're just a coward shrouding yourself in the tools of the weak. Mm. And, and, and I knew that I was close, but I just kept telling myself, like, wherever you show up next, you show up as a warrior and nothing less. And then especially the second time, when it was so close, I just kept telling myself, if you get the lungs and you get more time, that's a win. But if God calls you home, that's a bigger win. So it was a win or win more situation. It yeah. wasn't a win situation. And I kept that in my mind. And I really think that by keeping that in my mind, uh, that's what kept me going. But there was another thing that kept me going. See, I lost my father about two and a half years into my first transplant. So he wasn't around for my second transplant. And then the only thing that I feared was seeing my dad again and having him tell me, why did you quit, son? I never taught you that. Mm. That's one of the things that kept me going. And then also... My daughter, who is now, you know, just maybe just turned 20. And there was just this thing in me, in my heart that said, you have not given this young lady enough time or enough uh, knowledge to navigate her way through this world without you. You owe her better. You owe her more. Mm. So I just kept fighting. And I knew that I may have been teaching her the last lesson <laughs> I would ever teach her in life. And that's to never give up, no matter how bad it is. Yeah. But maybe I wasn't. Maybe there was more. And I just had to keep believing. Yeah. And many times in life, we say we believe in ourselves. But then we turn around and operate in self-sabotage. Yeah. Woo, that part. Those two things don't go together. No. Never will. Mm -mm. Kind of like having a peanut butter and tuna fish sandwich. Oh, that's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Those two things will never go together, right? No, and no. it is disgusting. Mm -hmm. But so is beating ourselves up with our own words and our own thoughts. So... That is so real because I'm I'm thinking as you were talking about the importance of keeping our mindset in that place, you know, because it feels like if you had given up in your mind, then you would have given up in your body. Yeah. You know, and that. that he told me I had two months to live. If I would have listened to him and believed him, I yeah. probably would have been gone in a month. Exactly. I, I've seen it. Um, I have worked as a nurse for 30 years. So I've seen what you, a lot of that. And I've seen how they tell people, oh, you know, you, you, you got six months to live, you know, and the ones that 
accept it and say, okay, you know, I got six months to live. And then they, you know, get depressed and they, you know, go on this rabbit hole, you know, deep and, and they die. And sometimes even less than six months, but then there were yeah. other ones, right. There were other ones that <laughs> they were still living six years later, you know, because they didn't accept it. So, you know, the power of the mind is just so huge. You know what the crazy thing is? Is that when they told me I had two months to live, it was 97 months ago. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, oh. Were wow. they wrong? <laughs> they was wrong, yeah. <laughs> that was over eight years ago that they told me this nonsense. And I could have believed the nonsense. Mm-hmm. But I'm very many people do. I believed in God more than man. Yes. Because those men... And actually, some women did not know who Mark Rodriguez really was, or else they would have never been quitting on him. That's right. And I happened to run into the doctor that told me I had two months to live about two years after that. And uh, and I approached her. I said, you know, and and you know what I told her? I said, thank you. She said, for what? I said, for quitting on me. Because that day you quit on me, that got my fires burning so hot and kept them burning hot. So I would fight no matter what. And I would never give up because I didn't want to be like you guys. Mm. Wow. What did you and say? But Thank you. And make sure you tell all the other people at the transplant center that quit on me. I said, thank you as well. Because maybe if you didn't quit on me, I might not be here right now, but the fact that you did quit on me showed me something very real and very important that you guys were not cut out for that fight. So you actually did me a favor by yeah. checking out what you did mm -hmm. instead of thinking you could handle something that you were not capable of handling. Mm. So wow. thank you. And I said it as nice as I could, as intelligently as I could. I articulated myself in the best possible manner. But those are what's called one of those verbal beatdowns. Yes. <laughs> and like a physical beatdown, the bruises and the cuts will heal. They'll go away. Mm -hmm. When you catch a mental beatdown, those are the ones that keep you up at night. Yep. Keep you up for several nights. Those are the ones that have you questioning yourself. Yep. Those are the ones that shatter your confidence. Those are the ones that... That, that people go to therapy for. <laughs> I wasn't trying to do that. That's just the result of what happens. And I told them, be careful who you give up on. And actually, you're a doctor. You should never give up on anybody. And you should never be in the practice of stealing someone's hope. Or trying to anyways. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. And people come to you guys believing in miracles. You need to remember that miracles are possible too. Yes. And she didn't know what to say. And I said, thank you for your time. Have a good day. And I walked away and I went back in the building I was in. And before I walked in the doors, I turned around and I looked back and she was still in that same piece of asphalt that I left her in. <laughs> and her mind was spinning about a thousand miles an hour. But you absolutely, if 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 you're in that position, I mean... Be realistic, yes. Be honest, of course. Mm -hmm. But you can't just tell somebody they have an expiry date. I don't believe in that. When I when I used to hear that sometimes, I would say, they told you what? I said, they're not God. They don't know. That's what I said. Which one of you did God call? Exactly. And they thought I was crazy. Wait a minute, what? I said, because I know the Bible says... No man knows the day of the hour. Does it not say that? I know that it does. It does. And so I'm like, no, I, no, I don't even know that. I don't even know when my name is going to be on that roll. No, nobody does, no. but God does. Yeah. And, I, and, and even when I died, uh, I got a front row seat to the battle for my soul. That included demons coming after me, uh, falling into the fires of hell, and being saved by God's hand both times. Mm, awesome.
-hmm. And the last thing was I was looking at myself in an ICU. I hadn't even made it to yet. With mm -hmm. tubes coming out of my torso. Mm -hmm. Tubes coming out of my neck. Lines coming out of my neck and my arms and my hands. And a port here in my chest and all these machines. And I looked up behind me and it was Jesus. Mm. He's beautiful. Mm -mm -mm. He just had this glowing light, like mostly around his head. And it was just, can't even explain it. It was just mm. crazy. It's like something I've never seen before. And I, I, I know I can, but, but it was just, it was life altering. Yeah. I was going to say it, it, Sounds like it was surreal. Like you just and couldn't. To his couldn't right, he was holding hands with my dad, and to mm -hmm. his left, he was holding hands with my first donor, Michelle Stella. Oh. My dad and Michelle were holding hands with one of my first mentors, my lung brother, Jaime Munoz. Oh, wow. And then I went from looking down at it all like this, hovering over it, to being in the bed and looking up at them, with them looking at me and then nodding off to the right with the message that you have to go. You're not supposed to be here. It's not your time. And there's more work to do. You have to go. That's and so I, powerful. I, that's when they shocked me. Well, I remembered all these things. You know, when you're in a coma, you're not supposed to remember anything and you don't. But when I died, I wasn't in a coma anymore. I left here. Yeah. And then they brought me back and put me back in the coma. So that time from... When I was out of the coma to where they put me back in the coma, I remembered, I retained those memories. Mm, wow. That's awesome. And they were very vivid. And they were as real as anything I've ever experienced in my life. Probably the realest thing I've ever experienced in my life was my death. And, and I say this all the time, and sometimes it comes off jokingly, but it's very true that... Uh, this life that I live is not for everybody. And even the ones it is for don't make it out alive. Nobody does. Mm -hmm. And so there's this saying that goes around with younger people. YOLO, you only live once. Well, I say that's a bunch of garbage because. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you've lived a few times. At because least that you, know. you have to live every day. Yes. You only die once. Unless you're the lung transplant stone racing. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's too so cool. <laughs> and the other thing that's very important is you have to laugh at yourself. Yeah. You have to be able to laugh at your struggles. Yeah, I agree. You have to be able to laugh when you're suffering. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't laugh at your own stuff, you have no business laughing at anybody else. Absolutely. I think we should laugh at ourselves first. Laughter is great medicine. Yes, it is. I love and, it. Uh, and you got to have fun. Even when you're dying, you still got to find a way to have a, a laugh and fun. And sometimes, like, I remember one time I'm crossing in front of the mirror and I looked at myself and I'm 120 pounds and my skin is gray and all you can see is bones and veins. And I just looked at myself and I saw this version of myself that was scary to look at. And but wait, I, how tall are you? I'm like 5'11". Oh, God, you look like a skeleton. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I said. I looked in the mirror and I said, come on, bro, get it together. It's already going to be Christmas. And you're still wearing your Halloween costume. And I sat there and I started laughing till I started choking. I had to turn up the oxygen, but it was all worth it. I had to sit down on the toilet and, and like catch my breath, but it was all worth it. Yeah. It was all worth it. And and it's very important to laugh like, yeah. in life all the time. You should laugh, have a good valley laugh every single day. It's Absolutely. good for your mind and it's good for your body and it's yes. good for your soul. Yes, I agree. All of that. All right. We're going to land this plane. Um, I do have a question to ask you. I try to ask all my guests this question. What if there was anything in the world that you could change? What would that be? Ah, uh, I would outlaw the usage of the two words 
uh, the phrase I can't. Mm. I would make that punishable. Uh, I would throw all the people that say I can't in jail. Uh, because in life, when you're going to do anything, you have to believe it first. Yeah. You have to believe that you're capable of doing it. If you get it in your mind and in your heart, you won more than half the battle. Because the actual physical act of it is not the hardest part. Right. That is simply the body following orders and being obedient. Yes. You think I can't, and then you speak I can't, and you give it life into the universe, then what other choice does your body have? That's right. It's like, I guess I can't, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of very powerful, intelligent, and amazing human beings limit themselves with those two words. Yes. And I tell everybody this, and I know it sounds a little corny, but I still say it. <laughs> American, and I'm also New Mexican. I'm not American or New Mexican. I <laughs> love it. In who <laughs> I so am. Corny, it's cute. The last four letters, I can. Yeah. It's in who I am. Yeah. So why would I ever think that I couldn't? Yeah, and the Bible clearly tells us things about doubting ourselves. Yeah. Philippians 4.13 clearly tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. So why would I ever doubt myself? Absolutely. You know that there's going to be thousands of people in your lifetime that will doubt you. Yeah. You should never become one of them. I love that. That is, I love it. I love it. So... Mark, share with the people how they can connect with you, the best ways to connect with you. And if you have anything that you're doing or offering, you can share that as well. Well, if one of, if any of this that I talked about tonight resonates with you and you're looking to do some things in your life, uh, you can reach me at the lung lungtransplantstonemason.com. And there I have my email, my phone number, and... Um, getting very, very close to unveiling my transformation empowerment coaching platform. And uh, soon I'll have my book available. And uh, actually been having a lot of people ask me, where can we buy your merch? <laughs> right. Make this stuff for that purpose. But a lot of people are asking me about it. So I'm thinking about uh, making that a possibility on my website as well. But um, I'm also on Instagram and TikTok as the Lung Transplant Stonemason and Facebook as Mark Rodriguez uh, from Santa Fe, New Mexico. You'll see my logo. Uh, it's easy to find. Yeah, I like that. I'm also on LinkedIn under my name, Mark Rodriguez. All right. So there you have it. You can reach him anyway. Probably can Google him as well. Um, all of his details will be in the show notes wherever you listen to this show or watch it because it is going to be on Spotify and any place that you listen to your podcast, you can get it. And it's also going to premiere on YouTube on my channel. So I am so grateful for Mark for coming on. And I know that, you know, he's had a long day and he was tired, but I'm so grateful that he that he came and that we were able to have this conversation so that he can inspire because I don't know about y'all, but that inspired me. You know, I, I mean, I think about it as like, I'm not a person that complains anyway, but if I was, this would make me flip that script. Because I mean, all the things that he's been through and had, as he has come through, that is amazing. I mean, the fact that he's a double lung transplant times two and he survived, you know, yeah. So again, I hope to that- remember. That surviving is not good enough because if we're just talking about surviving, yeah. eventually it becomes a sob story and no one cares. Right. The only time your story matters is when you when thrive you after yeah. you survive. Love it. It can have an impact. Love it. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been my honor. You are so and welcome. I will never be pleasure. too tired to inspire. Yes. Oh, that's if awesome. I like ready, that. If you stay ready, you never have to get ready. Yes, yes, that is awesome. So again, thank y'all for joining us on Straight Out of Savannah. Mark Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure and I cannot wait to see 
where your journey takes you. So Thank again, you so much. Yep. Good night. That's me, Jean. Thank you so much for joining Straight Out of Savannah with my guest, Mark Rodriguez. He was such an amazing young man. And he is the lung transplant stonemason, the first stonemason to have two double lung transplants. And so he's he is a miracle just to be here with us. And so I was grateful for him coming on the show. And if you want to reach out to him, if you would like to have him come and speak for you, because he does do speaking engagements, all his details will be in the show notes. And so if you are looking for some type of healing, I do healing services and I would love to work with you. So if you are looking for that, I have so many different ways that you can work with me. You will see my website, TammyYMorrison.com in the show notes. So you can click on that as well to see what other services I offer. So again, thank you so much for hanging out with me on Straight Out of Savannah. Bye now. In a world with the chaos and uncertainty. Sometimes all we need is a guiding light, a source of strength and a shoulder to lean on. Introducing Magical Healing Transformation Support. You can get three months, six months, or nine months of support where our experienced spiritual guides are here to help you find your inner balance, discover your true purpose, and navigate life's challenges with grace. Go to the website, https colon backslash backslash tammymorrison.com for our offerings. Or connect with me wherever you are listening to this. Send me a message. Get unleashed today. I know you've been blown away with the amazing value here today. Now go out and inspire the planet. And be sure to send us a message when you're ready to come talk about it. I'm straight out of Savannah. Talking with Tammy.